This video is sponsored by Skillshare. In the first minute of this video, I'm going to explain why salamanders might be a useful model for machine learning research. You've presumably heard of salamanders before, but for the sake of this video, this is a salamander. And of all the things that I probably learned about salamanders growing up, the one thing that has actually stuck with me over that period of time is the fact that salamanders can just ditch their tails in order to escape predators and grow back new functioning ones. That and the fact that licking certain salamanders will cause you to hallucinate, but that's a different video. Interestingly, there are also studies that have shown that if you transplant a salamander's tail onto a different part of its body, it will actually end up being remodeled into whatever limb is supposed to be in that area. And these are all examples of the ability of most biological organisms to determine their current anatomical structure, make sure it's the right one for whatever species they are, and regrow or remodel parts of their bodies in response to something being wrong, which is a pretty cool feature and it would be even cooler if we knew how it worked, both because it could potentially allow us to figure out how to do things like regrow our own limbs, but also, and more importantly for this video, it might allow us to create other types of self-organizing and self-repairing systems, like machine learning models. In all seriousness, if that sounds interesting to you, then stay tuned because we'll be talking about self-organizing systems and neural cellular automata, which are two techniques that might help us better understand how biological systems systems can self-organize and repair themselves, but also might help us develop machine learning systems that can do the same thing. All right, let's start by understanding cellular automata. Cellular automata are computer programs designed to automatically iterate through the evolution of a structure according to an update rule. Yeah, that probably didn't make a ton of sense. Let's just look at one instead. Cellular automata begin as a grid of cells where each cell can be in one of several states, for example, alive or dead. And for each step that we take in time, a new generation of cells is created based on a predefined update rule that takes into account the current state of each cell and the cells around it. The rule is the same for every cell, and typically every cell is updated at the same time, although we'll see examples of other approaches here. Importantly, it's self-sustaining. After designing a cellular automata and seeing the initial pattern, the program can continue to update with new generations indefinitely. One common example of cellular automata that you've probably heard of is Conway's Game of Life. In the game of life, the update rule goes as follows. Any live cell with two or three living neighbors remains alive. Any dead cell with three living neighbors becomes alive. Any other living cells die, and all other dead cells stay dead. Conway's Game of Life is well known because of the surprising ways that patterns and cycles can evolve in the system depending on the initial pattern that you set. But we're more interested in a recent adaptation of cellular automata called neural cellular automata, which are kind of a combination between neural networks and traditional cellular automata. We still have the grid and all that, but the update rule is actually the function that we would like our neural network to learn based on the structure that we're trying to target. And importantly, we can use this approach to create models that learn how to repair themselves, as well as to develop systems that can actually classify themselves. Distill, which is a great resource for anyone who's looking for interactive explanations of new machine learning models, has a series on neural cellular automata written by researchers from Google, including a collab notebook that lets you demo everything they discuss yourself, so we're going to hop over there for the rest of the video. All right, so in normal cellular automata, we have a grid of cells that update based on a predefined rule. When it comes to neural cellular automata, we create a neural network that can learn that rule based on what we'd like our automata to eventually generate, and you can see that model here. For every step that we take in the update rule, we take each pixel or each cell of our image, which has red, green, and blue channels, and create a perception vector, which is essentially looking at the change in the color channels for the neighboring cells in both the X and Y direction. From there, once we have our perception vector, we feed that through a neural network, and the neural network is trained to update all of our cells with the goal of updating all of our cells to the next step. We encode the intensity of color in each channel in those color channels in the perception vector, as well as a fourth channel that we term alpha. And what the alpha channel essentially encodes is whether or not a cell is living, being grown, or dead. You might be wondering what all the other parts of the perception vector are used for, and in this step we don't actually assign any intentional meaning to them, so we can just ignore those for now. Importantly, and I mentioned this earlier, in most cellular automata models, we update every cell at the same time, but for the purposes of this, we're actually going to do a stochastic update, which is to say that we're going to randomly choose to update some cells in every iteration, but not all of them. And we're doing this because when we think about self-organizing systems, systems like cells growing in our body, Cells don't all update at the same time, so if we'd like to model biological behaviors, then we have to introduce that randomness that our bodies already have into our model. Now we can train our model to see whether it can learn the correct update rule. 
As you can see here, we start off on the right foot, but something happens after our automata generates the image we want. It seems to be going a little bit haywire. Why? This has to do with the fact that we're training a dynamical system, but in short, when training our model, we only asked it to arrive at the target image, but didn't tell it what to do after it reaches it. Because of this, the model continues to try to generate the target image even after it has arrived at it, resulting in that instability that we see after a certain number of updates. Instead, what we want to do is train our model to arrive at the target image and then stay there, which is called making the target image an attractor in dynamical systems lingo. And to do this, the authors take incorrect and incomplete images and use them as the new initial patterns that the model must learn to recover from. So instead of always starting with that single living cell, the model might start with one of these haywire images and have to learn an update rule that will arrive at the correct target image in both cases. And you can see here that it actually works pretty well. All right, on to the next challenge. What happens if we remove a part of our image and ask the model to regenerate it? Yikes, that did not go well. But we can fix it with a similar approach to the one that we took to handle our haywire images. Before each update step, we'll randomly erase certain parts of the image, training our model to learn how to handle missing pieces in real time. Finally, if we'd like to make sure that we can generate images in different orientations, we'd only need to alter our features to reflect the angle that the images have been rotated by. And as an aside, this is kind of an interesting solution to me because it assumes that you know the angle that your image has been rotated by, which in the real world you probably don't and may or may not be easy to figure out computationally. Anyways, as you can see, we've developed a model that can fix itself. But what about self-classification? So in the next section of this distill article, we'll use the same basic model but with a couple tweaks. Namely, we're going to use the last 10 channels that we hadn't been using in our original model as a labeling system for each of the 10 digits that the numbers can be. And as we train our model, we'll use the label that has the highest probability to label each of our cells. Additionally, unlike in the last model, instead of using predefined convolutional weights for our features, we allow the model to learn parameters for these weights itself. Finally, and this is unlike our last model, we do not use the dead cells to perform computation. So in our first model, we used both alive and dead cells in order to update our image so that we could generate that final image that we wanted. Here, since we're mostly concerned with the pixels that make up the number itself, which are all live in this case, we're only going to factor those in when we make updates as opposed to also factoring in the surrounding dead cells because it doesn't really provide any more information. And then we train. As you can see, our initial results look good, but there's one weird thing happening. Comment below if you notice it. If you notice that some of our numbers seem to have an internal disagreement about their identity, you'd be right. The reason for this is a bit mathy, but in short, when our model predicts what the value of each cell is, it generates a probability for each state in those last 10 spots of our perception vector. And we use that information to determine how we're going to label the cell. Unfortunately, however, the loss function that we originally used, which is a cross entropy loss function, can cause two neighboring cells with the same state, so two cells that are labeled as nine based on their probability outputs, to have vastly different actual probability numbers. So in one case, the probability of a cell being nine might be 0.55, whereas in another case, the probability of a cell next to it might be 0.9. And these differences can make it difficult for all of the cells to stabilize into the correct prediction, which is what causes that disagreement. Luckily, we can fix that by changing the loss function, as you see here. All right, I'm gonna stop here with the distill examples, but I've included links in the description to both the articles themselves, as well as the collab notebook, if you'd like to see some of the other experiments that they run on self-classifying MNIST digits, as well as if you'd like to try your hand at it yourself. Going forward, self-organization and neural cellular automata might help us better understand how biological systems self-organize and self-repair. And we can do this in part by incorporating our knowledge of how the biological systems actually work into these models. And if you're still wondering why you should care about salamanders, it's because understanding how these self-organizing systems work in biological models like salamanders can help us understand how they work in ourselves, as well as how we might tap into those systems to do things like expedite wound healing or treat diseases like cancer, where we have another self-organizing system disrupting the function of our own. And speaking of why you should care, one of my goals in 2021 is to do a better job of making videos that show you why you should care about complicated or seemingly esoteric topics, like neural cellular automata. I mean, what even is that? Hopefully you know after watching this video. 
In fact, I'll be kicking it off by taking a course on Skillshare called Storytelling Through Film, which focuses on best practices for great storytelling through editing, and which is taught by the editor for the Yes Theory YouTube channel. If that sounds interesting to you, you should join Skillshare, an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey for less than $10 a month. They offer thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people, so if making YouTube videos isn't your thing, you can explore topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, so there's no ads, and they're always launching new premium classes like Thomas Frank's upcoming Productivity and Creativity course, where I happen to make a guest appearance. Skillshare members get unlimited access to thousands of inspiring classes with hands-on projects and feedback from a community of millions. And most classes are under 60 minutes with short lessons to fit any schedule. So if that sounds interesting to you, you can join Skillshare and support my channel by clicking on the link in the description. In fact, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to use the link in the description will get a free trial of Skillshare premium membership so that you can explore your creativity. Otherwise, if you like this video, you can let me know by smashing the like button and subscribing to my channel. You can also check out some of my other videos on future tech, like storing data in DNA and how that might help us make better machine learning models. You can also follow my PhD life on Twitter and Instagram, and otherwise, I will see you all on Monday. Bye.